called the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it's also customary to welcome new members to this House. Mm. Though I have to say, given you're a stickler for parliamentary time limits, this could be difficult. <laughs> but I do welcome all 11 new members to the first of these debates. One for the party opposite, two for the party that sits over there, and eight on these benches. <laughs> Victories which show without question that Britain is ready for change. Victories that have reduced the party opposite, now nearly 14 years in power, to the desperate spectacle of claiming it offers change away from itself. <laughs> Today's address shows just how ridiculous that posturing is, because what we have before us is a plan for more of the same. More sticking plasters, more division, more party first, country second gimmicks. And, to, and no repudiation of the utterly discredited idea that economic growth is something the few hand down to the many. Yeah. In fact, today we reach something of a new low because they're not even pretending to govern anymore. They've given up on any sense of service. They see our country's problems as something to be exploited, not solved. Yeah. And in doing this, they underestimate the British people. Because what Britain wants is for them to stop messing around and get on with the job. People want action, not inaction. Solution to real problems, not the imaginary ones that haunt their party's imagination. A government committed to the national interest, not desperately trying to save their own skin. Our schools are crumbling, waiting lists rising. Rivers and streams dying, infrastructure cancelled, violent criminals released early, their mortgage bombshell blowing up the finances of millions, growth set to be the lowest in the G7 next year, taxes higher than at any time since the war. He raised them himself 25 times. The Tory recipe for British decline, low growth, high tax, crumbling public services, with the Prime Minister serving up more of the same. The biggest question is how they think this is anywhere near good enough. After all the chaos they've unleashed, after levelling up, no rules are broken, we're all in it together, and all the other broken promises of the last 13 years, this is the plan they put to the working people of this country and say, trust us, we've changed. It's laughable. They can't see Britain. That's the only possible conclusion. The walls of this place are too high. But let me assure the House, Britain sees them, and Britain sees today that they offer no change on public services, no change on the cost of living crisis, and no change to the economic model that has failed to give working people the security and opportunity that they deserve. Because, Mr Speaker, that is the change that Britain needs. And today was a missed opportunity. We needed a King's speech that would draw a line under 13 years of Tory decline, a King's speech for national renewal and a serious plan for growth. But instead, we have a party so devoid of leadership it is happy to follow a Home Secretary who describes homelessness as a lifestyle choice. <laughs> and believes that the job of protecting us all from extremists, the most basic job of government, is legitimate terrain for her divisive brand of politics. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as Director of Public Prosecutions, I worked closely with the police and counter-terrorism forces. Their job is hard enough already without the Home Secretary using it as a platform for her own ambitions. So I say to the Prime Minister, think, think very carefully about what she is committing your government to do.
and think very carefully about the consequences of putting greater demands on public servants at the coalface of keeping us safe. Because without a serious Home Secretary, there can be no serious government, and he cannot be a serious Prime Minister. Homelessness is a choice. It's a political choice. Constant U-turns on no-fault evictions are political choices. Not facing up to the blockers of aspiration on those benches is a political choice. And it's not that there aren't better choices. On these benches, we have a plan to build 1.5 million homes across the country with a reformed planning regime that will unlock our potential. Because you can't fix homelessness without increasing the supply of housing. You can't boost growth and let workers have homes they need. And you can't escape the cost of living crisis unless there's more affordable housing. Now, we all know why he finds himself in this position. But if he's prepared to stand up to the blockers, if he shows he can radically improve the supply of housing by bringing back national housing targets, then yes, he can count on Labour votes. Because, Mr Speaker, that is what this country needs most, a credible plan for growth, a Britain where growth comes from the grassroots, where growth serves the grassroots with higher living standards in every community, an ambition that can only be delivered if we roll up our sleeves and get building. But the moment just to get a tunnel built in this country can require a planning application 30 times longer than the complete works of Shakespeare. (laughs) That is why today we needed a planning bill to strip out the red tape and get Britain building. We also needed a bold commitment to train the next generation with new technical colleges, apprenticeship levy reform, expert teachers in every classroom, giving British businesses the skills they need. We needed a modern industrial strategy on a statutory footing with a bill to match, a signal of intent to the world that we are serious about fighting for the jobs of the future. We needed an employment bill. Time and again, this bill has been promised. Time and again, it fails to materialise. When we could be scrapping fire and rehire, ending zero-hour contract, making work pay with a real living wage, and saying unambiguously that strong workers' rights are good for growth. What we got instead is an exercise in economic miserabilism, an admission that his government has no faith in Britain's ability to avert decline. Take the oil and gas bill announced today, a bill that everyone in the energy sector knows is a political gimmick. And even the Energy Secretary admits will not take a single penny off anyone's bills. Now, I don't know which of his seven bins the Prime Minister chucked her meat tax in, but this one will follow soon. Nonetheless, it is a gimmick that tells a story. A King's speech with no concern for the national interest, wallowing in a pessimism that says the hard road to a better future isn't for Britain. It's been this way for 13 years now, a failure to seize the opportunities, perhaps even to see the opportunities. Working people hit because they didn't build the gas storage, they didn't invest in clean British energy, they scrapped home insulation, and they're doing it all again, moving the targets back, passing it on to the next generation, even as costs rise and rise sticking plaster politics, an approach as riven through the foundations of our security as the crumbling concrete in our schools. The never-ending cycle of Tory Britain, party first, country second, drift, stagnate, decline. We have to turn the page on this, Mr Speaker. They are wrong about clean energy. It is cheaper. It is British and it can give us real security from tyrants like Putin. But more importantly, they are wrong about Britain. We can win the race for the jobs of tomorrow. We can work hand in glove with the private sector and invest in the critical infrastructure, 
the gigafactories, the new ports, the clean British steel that can once again light the fire of renewal in Britain's industrial communities. Today was the day we could have struck the match on that light, embraced a new sense of mission and tackled the cost of living crisis with a new plan for growth. It was a chance to get Britain building again, take back our streets, get the NHS back on its feet, deliver cheaper bills with real energy security and tear down the barriers to opportunity. But, Mr Speaker, for the 14th year in a row, the Government passed it up, severed its relationship with Britain's future and gave up on the national interest. Because what this address shows, with ever greater clarity, is that the only fight left in them is the fight for their own skin, a government that has given up, dragging Britain down with them ever more steadily towards decline, a day when it became crystal clear that the change Britain needs is from Tory decline to Labour renewal.